when the facts aren't on your side, you argue the law. And that's what Prosecutor Smith did in his opposition. He asked this court not to bother with the motion for a new trial, that this court ought simply to proceed to sentencing without caring a whit about Sabrina Lamone's due process rights. However, this court has the inherent, inherent power to ensure that Sabrina Lamone gets a fair <coughs> trial and indeed to fiercely protect the constitutional right of all criminal defendants to have effective assistance of counsel. Prosecutor Smith tells this court to just let a higher court worry about such trivialities and that a habeas corpus petition is more appropriate than a motion for a new trial. But the case that Prosecutor Smith himself cites, People v. Smith, says in footnote three that the Fosselman Court held that due process mandates that an incompetent counsel claim be considered in a motion for a new trial, not in a petition for habeas corpus. Also, despite the fact that Prosecutor Smith ignored prosecutorial misconduct, that precise claim is a statutory reason why a motion for a new trial should be heard. Prosecutorial misconduct occurred in this case because Prosecutor Smith called Jonathan Hearn to the stand knowing that he was a liar, a straight up liar in a senatorial suit. Prosecutor Smith cites to the Pope case that the facts brought to this court's attention are matters which are merely alleged. But there are no mere allegations here, Your Honor. Prosecutor Smith was personally aware that Jonathan Hearn was a liar because he sat through all of the January 2017 plea negotiation interviews. In footnote two on page four of my motion for a new trial, I asked the district attorney that if he had any questions with regard to facts that I raised, to please bring that issue to my attention immediately so that I could fact check and clarify with him, pointing him in the right direction. No inquiry ever came in that regard, and he raises no factual issues in his opposition. The facts, quite simply, are not in dispute. When the facts are in dispute, a petition for habeas corpus is appropriate because an evidentiary hearing may be held. We don't need that here. This court now has all the facts that it needs. I have synthesized a rather large file into a neat, digestible form for the court. This court gave me permission and time to write a motion for a new trial, and I did. I'm ready to argue it. If this court is able to make a decision on the motion for a new trial, it should do so. And this court can and should. Justice can be expeditious and swift in this courtroom. This learned court can make a determination that trial counsel was not effective in his representation of Sabrina Lamone. The questions answered is readily open, I'm sorry, the questions answer is readily open and apparent. Would any other defense attorney have put Sabrina Lamone on the stand to testify? Before she testified, Your Honor, there was one set of facts. One reasonable interpretation of that set of facts pointed to guilt, and the other, equally reasonable, pointed to innocence. And based upon the circumstantial evidence jury instruction, which Your Honor instructed the jury with, in this case, Sabrina Lamone's jury would have had to adopt the interpretation which points to her innocence. Without conceding if it was reasonable to put Sabrina on the stand, would any other defense attorney have not prepared her for direct examination and cross-examination? Would any other defense attorney have allowed her, in the state that she was in, on essentially a runaway train, to continue to blast down the hill without a fight to try to stop it? As in Fossilman, this court could well have intervened, called the attorneys into chambers, and inquired as to what was up with Sabrina Lamone. The Fossilman case involves a defense attorney who didn't object to a prosecutor's misconduct. Fossilman cites to the Ehlers case, where the court held that the case was seriously damaged by the defense attorney's failure to move to suppress evidence. Why didn't Sabrina's lawyer object to the lying, sole prosecution witness, Jonathan Hearn? Defense counsel seriously damaged the case by this failure. On Jonathan, I'm sorry, on January 3rd, 2017, Jonathan Hearn was brought out in custody to a meeting. 
Also present at that meeting, Prosecutor Smith, Detectives Meyer and Grantham, and Attorney Campbell. Hearn was asked, how do you know that Sabrina intended to have Robert Lamone killed? And Hearn answered, no, K-N-O-W, no, is a big word, meaning he didn't know whether or not Sabrina had any evil intent. Hearn said that in his mind, Sabrina was in on it, meaning if you ask somebody else, they might not think so. On January 5th, Jonathan Hearn said he didn't know what the January 3rd interview was for, that he thought he was making statements to support his own confession, not to show Sabrina's involvement. Not so. Hearn knew what the deal was immediately from the outset. But now that Hearn understands the assignment and that if he doesn't step up to the plate, his L is going to remain on his sentence, he flips 180 degrees and Sabrina becomes the catalyst who molded Jonathan to kill Robert, turning him from the church choir boy to the devil himself. Sabrina Lamone wasn't arrested after the January 3rd interview with Jonathan Hearn because frankly, the government didn't get anything that they needed against Sabrina on January 3rd. She was arrested on January 6th after the January 5th interview when he understood the assignment and he understood that he needed to step up to the plate or that L was still gonna be on his sentence. And now Sabrina has everything to do with it. And that is what the government needed. Jonathan Hearn, team prosecution. When you don't like the standard of proof, don't talk about it. And Prosecutor Smith didn't. He said we failed to show ineffective assistance to counsel. I need to do it by a preponderance of the evidence in a room of 100 criminal defense lawyers, would 51 of them say that defense counsel did not perform reasonably under prevailing professional norms? Absolutely yes, at least, at the very least, 50, 51. We are certainly not saying that defense counsel has to raise every available non-frivolous defense. We are certainly not saying that defense counsel has to be errorless. But we are saying, Your Honor, that defense counsel had to make the January 3rd interview a very big deal, and he didn't even mention it. Attorney Campbell, Jonathan Hearn's attorney, told Hearn in front of the others previously mentioned in the interview on January 3rd that a lot of the statements weren't recorded and that all they had as to non-recorded events was Hearn's memory, and that essentially Here's what prosecutor needs to hear from you. Though defense counsel didn't bring it out at trial, we know that Hearn has a bad memory. Bad memory, permission to lie, and a possible life sentence. That is a dangerous combination to have in a sole star prosecution witness. If it's not brought to light, it remains in the dark. The Pope case said that the right to constitutionally adequate legal assistance to counsel is denied if trial counsel makes a critical tactical decision which would not be made by diligent, ordinarily prudent lawyers in criminal cases. There was no satisfactory explanation for counsel to omit the January 3rd, 2017 interview. The best case, BESS, ponders how it is that trial counsel before trial could determine how witnesses would be impeached without ever having interviewed those witnesses. And the best court decides that this issue really needs no further discussion and that it was clear that the attorney failed to act as a reasonably competent professional performing as a diligent advocate. This court either need not belabor the point much. How could defense counsel again have ignored the January 3rd interview? This was the crux of the impeachment evidence to be used against Jonathan Hearn. It was the exculpatory evidence in the case. Defense counsel couldn't have ignored it, but he did. Prosecutor Smith says that Hearn was thoroughly cross-examined. Not so. Perhaps to his liking, because he didn't draw much blood. But in this case, the lack of impeachment implicated inadequate representation. It is not okay 
to not prepare your client for direct and cross-examination in her murder trial, literally the fight for her life. There is no explanation for this failure. There is no proper reliance on tactics or strategy. The Frierson case, sorry, the Frierson case, F-R-I-E-R-S-O-N, says that, of course, the fact that counsel is retained remains an important consideration in measuring the effectiveness of counsel's representation, and defense counsel here was, in fact, retained. The prosecutor says that Sabrina was visited a whole 17 times in 2017 before trial. I say, for how long each visit? And for that matter, the case of Duncan, cited by the prosecutor, says that we don't focus on time records in any event. That's not how this court makes decisions. Yes, Your Honor, there is a strong presumption that defense counsel acted reasonably, but presumptions can be rebutted and the presumption in this case is rebutted. Prosecutor Smith says that it is illustrative that our motion does not highlight the portions of that case, sorry, of the case, which might infer Sabrina's involvement. Illustrative of what? That I'm actually defending Sabrina Lamone? This is perhaps a surprise, a novel concept. The prosecutor has evidence in the case that he'll focus on, and he did. The defense attorney had evidence in the case, but he didn't focus on them. And one additional thing, this illustrative comment that Prosecutor Smith makes harkens to the circumstantial evidence nature of this case. There were portions which infer Sabrina's involvement. There are other portions which show that she was ignorant of what was going on. Absolutely, there's a reasonable probability to a demonstrable reality that defense counsel's failings affected the jury verdict. Prosecutor Smith, that there was ample and replete evidence against Sabrina, but he does not specify any of this ample and replete evidence, even though he himself says that this is a fact-probing and specific analysis. So ample and complete, in fact, that Sabrina was released immediately in November of 2014 with nothing additional to hold her, and not arrested again until January 6, 2017, when between the January 3rd and the January 5th interviews, he decided to once again walk as a civilian. Without Jonathan, there's no trial against Sabrina. Knock out Jonathan, knock out the conviction. And the January 3rd interview knocked out Jonathan. Defense counsel didn't use it. He didn't use the one piece of evidence that shows that Jonathan Heard did whatever it took to one day be free. He didn't use the one piece of evidence that shows that Prosecutor Smith did whatever it took to jail Sabrina Lamone forever. This crucial defense was withheld. It is quintessential proof of ineffective assistance of counsel in a case where it made a serious impact on the outcome. We're not saying that somebody could have done it better. We're saying that somebody should have done it, period. The jury asked for readback of a portion of Jonathan's testimony. They wanted to find out if he was telling the truth. And defense counsel precluded the jury from digging deep down beyond the words to see if they could find that truth. In Frierson, the court decided that defense counsel's giving up the mental incapacity defense was tantamount to a total withdrawal of any legal defense, a complete abandonment of the interest of the accused. The court stated that in the life or death context within which the failings occurred in that case, counsel's actions on the matter may be similarly characterized, actions of life or death. Prosecutor Smith argues harmless error, but not even close. The combustion of forces here have created a miscarriage of justice in the conviction of Sabrina Lamone. January 3, 2017 wasn't discussed. Sabrina was innocent on January 3, 2017, and Prosecutor Smith needed guilt. So on January 5, Jonathan lied, and Prosecutor Smith got guilt. 
There was no development of Sabrina Lamone's extrajudicial statements, so only one side of her showed. Her horrendous testimony, through no fault of her own, only further highlighted that one side. And the police put words in both Jonathan's and Sabrina's mouths, creating good and evil where needed, respectively. The Lopez case, cited by Prosecutor Smith, speaks of unhindered excess, which undermined the confidence in the outcome of the jury verdict. The January 2017 meetings represent <coughs> unhindered excess to try to get Sabrina Lamone. Prosecutor Smith personally witnessed Jonathan Hearn lie right in front of his eyes, giving Hearn an outdate and Smith the story that he needed against Sabrina, the truth unimportant. This court can bring us back to truth and justice. We ask that this honorable court grant our motion for a new trial and that the date of March 21st, 2018, a Wednesday, be set for a pretrial conference. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Smith, you care to respond? Sure. Uh, Your Honor, the initial portion of my motion noted uh, the difference between how a appeal, a direct appeal, is handled by the court versus a red papers court. So that is a reason for including that uh, within my motion. The nature of a direct appeal, which this is, which is allowed under false is that the record is what the court can rely upon. Because the trial court, as, count, uh, as the trial court for this case, was able to observe uh, the defense attorney and the trial in context. A writ of habeas corpus allows you to introduce the evidence that has been uh, provided to the court. So the nature of what the court is even allowed to rely upon in this case is the record, as in the record that was taken by the court reporter, the evidence that was presented in this trial. All the other information is outside of the scope of this hearing, and therefore it is uh, for use later on in a writ of habeas corpus. So that is the reason I included that uh, within my motion, just to note to the court that uh, all the other information uh, should be preserved and should, can be used later on in the appropriate setting. The nature of what has been alleged, first, there must be a showing that Mr. Terry, in this case, acted in a manner that was not reasonable under the circumstances. And there has to be a showing of tactics and that where the tactics are wrong. And what I've noted here is the tactics are exactly the same. There is nothing different. Uh, initially, Sabrina Lamone uh, testifying, that does not show ineffective assistance of counsel. Why does it not show ineffective assistance of counsel? Because she herself told this court that she wanted to testify. And she was testifying on her own behalf. So as it relates to whether or not that's ineffective assistance of counsel, Ms. Lamone's own decision to testify has no bearing on that. I also noted the number of times that Mr. Richard Terry went out to visit her as to show that there was preparation, there was uh, communication between counsel and Ms. Lamone prior to her testimony. They're also able to speak to each other freely throughout the pendency of the trial when they're here in court, and they did uh, throughout the trial. Uh, there was also a note in there uh, written by an affidavit by Ms. Lamone stating that she was shocked. Um, that is completely counter to what happened here in the courtroom. There was no evidence of this shock. There was even a lapse in time between uh, when she took their admonition was given to her by her defense counsel to when she actually testified because her sister was on the stand at the time. Also, the tactical argument, which is the same between current defense counsel and Mr. Terry, is that Ms. Lamone had no knowledge of what was going to happen, also did not have the desire to have her husband killed. I would note that all of the evidence that the court or the counsel is relying upon in their motion as it relates to wiretaps, as it relates to her statements, that all came into evidence. That was all available for the jury to review. So I think that argues against saying that Mr. Terry is, was incompetent when the exact same evidence that current defense counsel would rely on came into evidence in this present case and was available. 
Also, as it relates to Mr. Hearn, Richard Terry cross-examined Jonathan Hearn for multiple court sessions. What was the primary tactic? It's the same primary tactic that Ms. Marshall is using here to show Jonathan Hearn was untruthful, to show that he was a manipulator of Ms. Lamone, to show that he is fabricating evidence. Mr. Terry cross-examined both Jonathan Hearn and his family as it relates to his untruthfulness as to his belief level in Christianity. So there was extensive cross-examination as to whether or not he even lied to his family. There was fact-specific questioning regarding the attempted murder of cell phone records, location information, whether or not he could have gone out to Ms. Lamone's house to provide the poison on particular days. He cross-examined as to the lack of text messaging or emails discussing the poisoning plot. He also cross-examined why would Ms. Lamone allow poison into her home when she had two young children. He cross-examined as to Mr. Hearn's testimony about the poisoning of the neighbor's dog when there was no other report besides Mr. Hearn that indeed the dog had been poisoned. He cross-examined Mr. Hearn extensively why he purchased a burner phone for Ms. Lamone and not for himself, arguing why would he do that if he wanted to cover his tracks. He used fact-specific questioning regarding the murder to locate areas of untruthfulness or inconsistency in Mr. Hearn's testimony. He talked about or cross-examined when Mr. Hearn saw Robert Lamone the day of the murder, the direction that he drove, where he shot him at, the manner that he shot him at. All of these things, in my estimation, in an attempt to show that Mr. Hearn was untruthful on the stand. He inquired extensively about Hearn's law enforcement training that would allow him to be prepared in this current setting. He inquired about Mr. Hearn's knowledge of Robert's medical conditions or treatment in Tehachapi. Later on, Mr. Terry even admitted medical records, again, in an attempt to show that Mr. Hearn was untruthful in his testimony. He questioned Mr. Hearn extensively about his writings, including multiple items that are even contained in the motion. I noted to court exhibits K, L, P, R, S. Those were all admitted into evidence. And again, this is information that Ms. Marshall is relying upon. Those were inquired about. Those were argued by defense counsel. He cross-examined Mr. Hearn about his other relationships at the time of his relationship with Sabrina Lamone in an attempt to show a pattern of behavior by Mr. Hearn. He even had a defense witness testify about her ongoing text message relationship with Mr. Hearn. He cross-examined Mr. Hearn's awareness of Sabrina Lamone possibly being involved in other relationships while incarcerated. Again, this is in Ms. Marshall's motion. And again, this was cross-examined by Mr. Terry. He cross-examined Jonathan Hearn about a receipt of a lesser sentence for his testimony. Again, this has been argued by the current defense counsel and came out during cross-examination. He also included defense witnesses. He had four outside of Ms. Lamone. Actually, I believe five. Again, there has to be on the record a note of where the tactics would be different. There is none other than the cross-examination would have been more extensive in Ms. Marshall's opinion. That is insufficient under the standard of law. There is also information in the motion about Jason Bernatine, Kelly Bernatine, a Tiffany. There is talk about what they believe the likelihood of Ms. Lamone being guilty in this case. All that information isn't even admissible in court. We don't do evidence based on likelihood ratios. There is information in there about Tiffany and her opinion that Jonathan is a freaking psycho. Again, this is not information that is even admissible in court. The trial is not based upon people's opinions of one another. It's based upon evidence. There is information within this motion of text messaging between Ms. Cordova and Mr. Terry. It's used quite a bit throughout the motion. What Ms. Lamone's sister's opinion about the trial has to do with the ineffective assistance of counsel claim, I do not know. But it is included in page 5, 33, 34, 38, 39, 40, and 41. So it seems to be a primary basis of current defense counsel. I would note, though, however, on Exhibit X, there is a portion where Ms. Cordova actually sends a text to Mr. Terry that says, 
you are doing an awesome job, Richard. Everyone said you're awesome. So prior to the conviction of Ms. Lamone, uh, Ms. Cordova obviously believed Richard Cherry was doing an awesome job. Everyone else known to her thought he was doing an awesome job. Ms. Lamone got convicted, and so here we are. Suddenly, he's ineffective. It should be also notable that Mr. Terry did not decline to use a meritorious defense in this case. A current counsel merely advocates there should have been more strenuous cross-examination. It should also be noted that Ms. Lamone was found not guilty on two counts. That would be counts four and five. This argues in favor of Mr. Terry's competence at trial. Defense must show that it's reasonably probable a more favorable result would have been obtained. Uh, there is no difference in tactics. There is no difference in defense. So just the bare assertion that it would have been a different result is insufficient to the, for the court. Uh, the guilty verdict rests on Ms. Lamone's actions, her statements, her text messaging to Jonathan Hearn after the trial. Uh, it, is as it relates to Ms. Lamone covering up the crime, which is heard in the wiretaps. Uh, the evidence in this case included, again, text messaging, burner phones, wiretaps, police interrogation statements. Both principals in this case testified. That would be Jonathan Hearn and Sabrina Lamone. Evidence showing even that uh, Ms. Lamone lied to police uh, was available in the phone records, absent her testimony showing that she called Robert's phone repeatedly and told police that she had while she was talking to Jonathan Hearn on another phone. The record itself shows uh, that it's substantial evidence relating to Ms. Lamone's guilt even absent her testimony in this case. There has been no showing of prejudice. There has been no showing uh, that there is a reasonable probability uh, that there would have been a different re result. And an argument that there is cannot rest on a foundation of the same tactics. And that is all that this is. This is a, a very long motion arguing the exact same tactics, that Ms. Sabrina Lamone didn't have any knowledge of it, that Mr. Hearn is a manipulator, a liar, etc. All of those things came out in the evidence. All of her statements were in evidence. Uh, there was numerous letters of Mr. Hearn in evidence. Uh, so as to this case, there was not an effective assistance of counsel. There is no showing of any errors made by Mr. Terry. And again, what the court can rely upon in the direct appeal in this setting is the record of what the court observed uh, during the hearing. I'll submit. Marshall, uh, I'll let you respond to that. Thank you, Adam. If you are arguing that the prosecution witness is lying and you leave out the first part of an interview session of plea negotiation discussions which essentially shows in a demonstrative way that the prosecution witness is a liar and you don't use it during trial. That is not the tactic that I would take. It is not the tactic that most of my friends, criminal defense lawyers, would take. You have to use everything that you have as a retained attorney representing a client for first degree premeditated murder. And he didn't. And this woman sitting to my right and the folks in the gallery behind me to my right are shattered that the person that they hired to protect her and to have her back and to make sure that nothing bad happens to her, failed her, failed them. Robert Lamone in heaven cannot believe that this is what is happening. This is to the core 
the most reprehensible form of omission that a defense attorney could possibly do. This is taking out from the jury consideration the fact that Hearn is lying. That's a big deal. I wouldn't have done that. And I don't think that any reasonable, reasonably competent criminal defense attorney would have. And you don't put up your client next to that preparation, next to that untouchable preparation, a firefighter. This girl. It was a train wreck watching her testimony. An absolute train wreck. It, and it didn't stop. And there was no preparation during her testimony. So that if it was perhaps off course initially, maybe we can write the train and get it back. It just kept on going. And it got worse. And it got worse. And it got worse. And then defense counsel ends with, by the way, is it difficult for you to communicate? Really? That, that's what we're going to wrap this up with. Is it difficult for you to communicate? How about prepare your client for direct and cross? With this prosecutor? This girl? So, Prosecutor Smith saying nothing's different. January 3rd would have made it real different. And her testimony and her saying, yes, Your Honor, I understand, scared, beyond words, not protected, not knowing, unprepared. We, we're going to take a yes word on, on a waiver statement and just take that as, as a yes. I don't think so. I think we got to look underneath that. We also have to see that in the record, there's no weighing of pros and cons. Let's see, we have a circumstantial evidence case and her statements don't sound that bad. And he's a liar. So we got that angle. You don't put her up. No evidence of shock. Her whole testimony was sh evidence of her shock. She had no idea what was going on. Sorry. And we can't have confidence in this verdict because of all of this. Cross-examined her for multiple course sessions. Okay, great. You know, there, there's a section in my motion regarding who cares if he drove east or west in front of the Patco building? Who cares what angle of the gun was present when he was shooting out of the backpack? Where was he? Who cares about any of that? There was no dispute as to the fact that Hearn killed him. Here's how he died. There, none of that is in dispute. And we're going to talk about that instead of talking about the January 3rd interview? And, and we're going to put this other gal who had a texting relationship on the stand instead of talking about January 3rd? And, and Prosecutor Smith is saying we can't rely on somebody's opinion about the trial, but oh look, you know, he's doing such an awesome job. Which is it? He didn't do an awesome job. I'm sorry. He's been practicing just about as long as me. He's got probably a year on me. He didn't. And she is facing life in prison without the possibility of ever getting out, ever holding her kids again ever touching her kids again.
So Prosecutor Smith's statement that the fact that Jonathan Hearn is a liar came out in evidence, it's really not true. Because there was a lot that was there that the jury could have seen. I'm not going to rehash 68 pages. I don't think the court would appreciate it. There was a lot to show that he was a liar. January 3rd, the icing. He was a liar, a bad, bad man, a murderer, and a liar. And it didn't come out. If the court is taking pause at the prosecutor's statement that anything, only things that are on the record can be explored, I don't think that the law provides that. I think that the law allows the court to go beyond the record in certain situations in an effective assistance to counsel claim. I, again, have synthesized it to the point where the court can. The cases say that if the court should can rule, it should do so. I think the court can. And I think that to hide behind a, an assertion that we can't go beyond the record for the court not to be allowed to look at the first interview of January 3rd before the subsequent ones happen is dirty. And I think the court should. And I appreciate very much the court's time. And again, we ask that the motion for a new trial be granted. Thank you. Smith, last word. I'll submit to the court. All right. I've read and considered the briefs, and I've heard the oral arguments regarding the motion for a new trial. Counsel, I appreciate both of your arguments and your advocacy. Motion for a new trial is denied. Proceed to sentencing. Mr. Smith, ready to proceed? I am. Ms. Marshall, any legal cause why judgment should not now be imposed? No, you are. The record reflected I have read and considered a fourteen-page probation officer's report dated October 30, 2017 by Janelle Ferreira. In addition, I've received a sentencing memorandum by Ms. Marshall. By the way, Counsel, it reads Sharon Beth Moore. Yeah. I wasn't even married at the time, so I apologize. It's all right. And numerous letters also attached. Mr. Smith, did you file anything in response to the sentencing memorandum? I did not. All right. Counsel, I did also receive last week, and I believe you would have received by now, two letters that came in from Nicole Rushton and Sean Ware that I received on the 15th of last week. Did you both get copies of those? Yes, sir. There should have been a note attached that how I would be looking at those. Neither one of those qualifies as a victim impact statement. Correct, Your Honor. All right. Very good. Okay. Mr. Smith, are you planning to present any evidence or testimony regarding the sentencing? Your Honor, there's two people that would like to speak in relation from the victim's family. Okay. Ms. Marshall, do you? I don't believe so. I think that the answer is no. Okay. I'd be inclined to have Mr. Smith's people talk first, then I'll hear your comments. Certainly. Okay. Mr. Smith, please. Ma'am, could you step up to the podium, please? Tell me your name and spell your last name for the record. We're going to do this together. My name is Chris Wilson. Chris Wilson. C-H-R-I-S Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. Go ahead. I just want to put this picture out. Today, 
day I brought a picture that summed up who Robert Lamone was. It's been over three years since this journey began with a horrific phone call from my mom. A journey filled with losses, not only my beloved brother, but my mother as well fell victim to this. A journey filled with heartache and pain that most people could not comprehend. But along the way, I have met a lot of great people that I have turned into lifelong friends. And the one common bond is this guy named Robert Lamone. And today, that's where I choose to focus all my thoughts. Our brother Robert was one of the kindest humans I will ever know. Truly the guy that would give the shirt off his back if you needed it more than him. That guy that always stopped to help someone along the road. The thumbs up guy with the big smile. The entertainer, the loving son, the caring father, the entertaining uncle. He would cut your grass, fix your drywall. He would service your car and wash it too if it was dirty. He would even man the barbecue, also known as the Robicue. You might even come home to find him working on your boat and getting it ready for the lake. He provided for his family. He loved the railroad and he loved the lake. He was quick to encourage but slow to criticize. Robert put everybody before himself. The bond that ties siblings together will never be broke and our brother's memory will forever live in our hearts. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast, but it's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This was my brother. Though we are all glad to see this come to an end, we do not rejoice and celebrate. We move forward and have faith that the judicial system has prevailed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Sir Smith, do you have a hand? Ma'am, can you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record, please? My name is Lydia Marrero. M-A-R-R-E-R-O. Go ahead, ma'am. On August 17, 2014, we lost a son, a brother, a husband, a father, an uncle, a friend, and a co-worker. The weekend of August 23rd, 2014, Robert and I planned a trip to Phoenix, Arizona to meet with my sister, Mary Ann to start arrangements for my dad to enter the hospice facility. Instead, we gathered six days earlier in Hallandale for the devastating news that our brother had been murdered. Dad's arrangements were temporarily interrupted as family and friends gathered that weekend in Hallandale instead to celebrate my brother Robert's lap. Robert Mendoza Limon, your death left in its wake a tremendous emotional pain. Our dad passed away August the 26th, 2014, and we didn't have the heart to tell dad that Robert was murdered. In a state of being, he most likely wouldn't have been able to deal with my brother's death. Human beings are naturally resilient, concerning most of us can endure loss and then continue on with our lives. Parents have believed that in the natural order of life, the older generation should die first. They have a great difficulty with the fact that their child, young or grown, has been killed while they themselves still live. The death violates their expectations. Some people like mom, Cheryl Reyes struggled with the grief constantly. She struggled trying to carry out simple daily activities. She used to look forward to Sunday afternoons where Robert would call her to share his hopes, his dreams, his future, 
his love for life, and the moments that he shared with his children, Robert and Leanna. After Robert's death, she would get occasional calls from Robbie and Leanna on Sundays, then the calls stopped. Mom was so heartbroken after losing her only son. June 14, 2016, Mom passed away. She would never have been able to sit in the courtroom to listen to how her son's life was taken with such malice and consideration and selflessness and such a precious, God-fearing life. For myself, this murder is its own deeper level of denial and shock. When someone's murdered, the death is sudden, violent, final, and incomprehensible. The event is unbelievable, unexpected, tragic, and a crime all at once. The shock of losing Robert to murder took hold immediately and left family and friends, co-workers, totally bewildered. To take it one step further, it was even more horrific to find out that our brother's wife participated in conspiring in the planning and execution of his murder. Nothing in life prepares sorrow or loss with acute feelings of injustice and trust, division and helplessness. Flashbacks to the memory of receiving the dreaded call from the Cordobas of my brother's death can continue to replay in my mind still even today. The memory of the crime itself in beds of rage of, at the conspirator, Sabrina Lamon, and the assailant, Jonathan Hearn. Hearn testified that he prayed before he took our brother's life, then again after, asking for forgiveness and for avoiding arrest, all on a Sunday, a holy day of obligation. God doesn't work that way. The parable in the Gospel of Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46, points consequences of the choices we make and the kind of life we choose to follow. God does have plan. God does have a plan, only it's not for the reasons the two of you prayed for. I believe God gave Sabrina a choice. Build a friendship or choose the deceit by concealing an affair that resulted in the murder of our brother. Sabrina had all the power to make the final decisions to do what was right. Instead, she made the decisions that brought overwhelming destruction, division, brokenness to the two most affected by her actions, her brother's children, Robbie and Leanna. This includes the Lamont family, the Wilson family, the San Milan family, the Cordova family, the Hearn family, and all the family and friends affected by her thoughtless actions. It's easy to think that only other people get divorced, that your own marriage is somehow immune to heartache, infidelity, and fights over who gets the house, the car, or the children. God created marriage as a loyal partnership between one man and one woman. In this world, broken things are despised and thrown out. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate and love one another, or you will devote to one another and despise the other. You are not able to serve both God and money. Do you truly believe that you had the best of both worlds, living in a marriage of deceit by your own unfaithfulness because you couldn't be honest with Robert about your feelings that you were secretly having an affair? Marriage works best when both partners are willing to make a sacrifice and commitments. Sabrina didn't have the desire to make sacrifices and commitments to save her marriage. She chose a path of destruction and selflessness engaging in extramarital relationships that ultimately ended my brother's life. I can find peace of mind knowing the truth that Jonathan has brought forth. I said forth, I said before, if you're going to conspire with someone, abate with someone, or bring harm or murder someone, that you should have to be accountable for your actions. We still miss Robert as much now as we did then. We miss and deal daily with being shut out of Robbie and Leanna's life because the right words to explain truth to them are caught up in a whirlwind of denial and acceptance of the outcome that has resulted from such a senseless act. No time either Sabrina or Jonathan serve in prison will ever bring my brother back. The last three years 
and their unfortunate future seem irrelevant to the 38 years of our brother's life that was taken so violently. David Reyes asked that I share a few words, and that was that the loss of Robert has irreversibly changed our lives forever. On behalf of our mother, my wife, who passed away as a result of losing her only son, while she had some health issues, losing her son was overwhelming, and I saw day by day the devastating effects it had on her health. As a family, we lost two wonderful human beings. We lost, we lost most costly a father of two beautiful, innocent children who didn't deserve to be put through all of this. We also lost his mother, my wife, who had only spoken to Robert on the phone 12 hours earlier before we got the news that any parent doesn't want to hear. Then to find out he died, he died and who was involved was more than his mother could bear. As the investigation of Robert's homicide continued, shocking revelations came out and with more pain and suffering for myself and his mother. As our lives continue without Robert or and Sharon, we'll never forget the devastating effects we must now learn to live with because of your affair. I respectfully res request that the maximum sentence by well of California law be imposed on the defendant for each count for which she is found guilty. Thank you. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Here are your comments, Count. Thank Obviously, I was hoping for one hearing this morning. So to write this sentencing memorandum was difficult, and it was difficult to even file it with the court. The court knows that we are asking for a sentence which is not usually handed down in cases such as this. I have written that we are asking for a probationary grant and time served for Sabrina Lamone to be released to her family from court today. I will note that in the probation officer's report, quote, there are no statutory provisions which would limit or prohibit a grant of felony probation to the defendant in this case. This court is allowed to do that. People versus McCullen, which is a 1971 case at 19 Cal at 3rd, 796 at pages 800 and 801 states, quote, the record reflects that defendant was not personally armed with the 22 caliber rifle, apparently sawed off, used to fire the fatal bullet either at the time of the offense or the time of his arrest. Consequently, he was not barred from consideration for probation as a matter of law, even though convicted of first degree murder. Sabrina is similarly situated. And I think that the factors that I have set forth in the motion suggests that a probationary grant is appropriate and the court could act in such a way if the court chose to do so. 
and I'm asking the court to choose to do so. The letters that have been submitted on behalf of Sabrina speak to a woman of sunshine and light and love. And that is who Sabrina is. That's what's in her heart. That is what exudes from her. And that will always be. I'm gonna read from Robbie Lamone and his letter. Please, I just want you to know that my mom is one of the best people I know. She's loving, caring, and loves God. She loved my dad, and we did everything together. I need my mom in my life. She's my best friend. She means the world to me and would do anything to get her home. I miss her smoothie she made us every morning. We are as close a family as a family can be, and I pray that it will stay that way. My mom did everything for us and always will. She will always be my mom, and I will always love her for that. I really need my mom in my life. I need her to help me with school and my breakups and help me tie my tie on my wedding day. Please help make that happen. And he's writing to your arm. From Leanna Lamone, she begins. Please let my mom come home. My mom needs us. Please let her come back. I need her. She is my mom. Please let her come home. I don't have my mommy or dad. I need her home. Please, I need her. I can't live my life without her. She is my mother. I don't want her to be gone longer. She can't be gone until I am 12, 13, 14, 15, she goes all the way up to 23. Or an old lady, I need her. I guess if you're 24, you're an old lady. I hope she will be home soon. Those are from Robbie, I'm sorry, those are from Robert and Sabrina's kids. Again, I very much appreciate the court's time and the court's considerations. And with that, I'll Smith. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Well, Your Honor, Ms. Lamone is not a suitable candidate for probation in this case. I think the, what she was convicted of argues that she should be sentenced to the maximum that is allowed under the law. What she was ultimately convicted of shows her participation in this case. She was convicted of murder and murder with premeditation and deliberation in that she weighed the pros and cons of her actions and following that she decided to act. She was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder. That would be the murder of her husband. She was convicted of soliciting another to commit the crime of murder. That is act asking Jonathan Hearn to commit the murder of her husband. She was also convicted of accessory after the fact uh, for the cover up that she was involved in after the murder of her husband. As it relates to those charges, that is shown, shows her involvement in this case. And she is not a suitable candidate uh, for appropriation. I'll submit. Do you need this one? No, Your Honor. Thank you. So Marcia, submit. I would just say that Mr. McCollum was also convicted of first degree murder and was granted probation. I'm sorry, was not granted probation, but the court didn't believe that it could grant him probation. Went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal said, "Yes, you can," and it was sent back. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Counsel. In order to uh, optimize legitimacy, public reassurance, and public confidence in sentencing, this court strives to be fair, uh, even-handed, and consistent. It's difficult to be consistent 100% of the time because I look at and evaluate each case individually and on its own merits. In this case, I have read and considered the briefs and arguments and the attached letters from friends and family. 
Many of the letters from the defense reiterate the fact that the defendant is a kind and loving woman and capable of this crime. However, 12 jurors sat in that jury box, thought otherwise, and unanimously convicted her of murder, uh, first degree murder. The prosecution secured a conviction in this case, but in my opinion, there really are no winners here. Almost everyone in this case ends up losing out based on bad choices. The defendant made bad choices. John Hearn made bad choices. They have been and will be severely dealt with because of those choices. However, please note that two very important people involved in this case will be punished who had no input, made no choices, and that's the Lamone children, Robbie and Leanne. God bless them. Yes. Their worlds were changed in an unimaginable way when their father was murdered and now is punished a second time when their mother will be sentenced and incarcerated for her actions in the death of their father. Please note there is a group of people left out of the equation up to this point, and that's the friends and family of Rob Lamone. Rob Lamone's dead. He can't be visited in prison. He won't have a parole date set. His family is only left with the cherished memories of him, an empty chair at the table and an unopened Christmas gift under the tree. I'm going to impose sentence here in a minute, but before I do so, I'm going to make a simple request of both Sabrina's side of the family and Rob's side of the family. Don't continue to make the children victims. Both families need to set aside their differences and focus on the health and well-being of these two innocent children. It's absolutely imperative you come together in cooperation and work in unison to see to it that they have everything they need. Turn your anger towards each other to instead love, provide for, and guide these two children. Thank you. The defendant will be sentenced as follows. Circumstances and mitigation are not. The defendant has no prior criminal record of conviction. Circumstances and aggravation strike that. Circumstances and mitigation are the defendant has no prior record of criminal conviction. Circumstances and aggravation are not. The defendant does qualify for punishment in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation based on the current offense. And there are no statutory provisions which would limit or prohibit a grant of felony probation in this case. You are correct on that, Ms. Marshall. Thank you. The defendant is not considered a suitable candidate for a grant of felony probation in this case due to the extreme egregious nature of this crime and that the victim was killed as a result of the defendant's role in planning the murder. The defendant conspired with their co-defendant, Jonathan Hearn, which ultimately led to Hearn shooting and killing the victim. It is felt a prison sentence is the only appropriate consequence in this case. Taking into consideration the factors in mitigation versus none in aggravation, the low term in sentencing will be ordered after the determinant count not being stayed. As to count one, murder in the first degree, the term by prescribed by law is 25 years to life. As to count six, accessory after the fact, the low term of 16 months is in play. Counts two and three appear to arise from the same set of operative facts as count one and will be ordered stayed pursuant to Penal Code Section 654. As to counts one and six, consecutive sentencing will be ordered in this case in that one, the crimes and their objectives were predominantly independent of each other, and two, the crimes were committed at different times or separate places rather than being committed so closely in time and place as to indicate a single period of aberrant behavior. Please note that determinate and indeterminate terms do not mix and are computed separately. Indeterminate sentences are not part of the principal subordinate computation under PC 1170.18, so an indeterminate sentence cannot be served as the principal term. Instead, determinate and indeterminate sentences are to be considered and calculated independently of one another in state prison. As a result, the defendant will be sentenced as follows. As to count one, a violation of Penal Code Section 187A for the accompanying PC 189. Probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the term prescribed by law of 25 years to life. The defendant will pay restitution pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F an amount of $2,389.72 to Chris Wilson for related losses. She'll pay restitution pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F, an amount of $394.33 
to Lydia Marrero for related losses. The defendant will pay restitution in an amount to be determined by the probation department at the direction of the court to the restitution fund pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4F2 for victim compensation and government claims board reimbursement to the victim. The defendant will pay a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and a fee in the amount of $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count two, a violation of Penal Code Section 182A with the PC 187A, probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the term prescribed by law of 25 years to life. Punishment for that sentence to be stayed pursuant to Section 654 of the Penal Code until the successful completion of the sentence opposed above and permanently thereafter. There will be a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count three, a violation of Penal Code Section 653 F sub B, probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the low term of three years. Punishment for that sentence to be stayed pursuant to Section 654 of the Penal Code until the successful completion of the sentence opposed above and permanently thereafter. There is a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 and $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373. As to count six, the violation of Penal Code Section 32. Probation will be denied and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for the low term of 16 months. That sentence to be served consecutive to the sentence opposed above for a total fixed term of 25 years to life plus 16 months. The defendant will pay a fee in the amount of $40 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1465.8 $30 pursuant to Government Code Section 70373, $300 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.4b as a restitution fine, and a restitution fine in the amount of $300 pursuant to Penal Code Section 1202.45. Payment of that fine is suspended subject to parole or post-release supervision revocation proceedings. Ms. Herrera, updated custody credit, please. 415 actual Zero good work for a total of 450. Do you agree with that, Ms. Marshall? I do. Madam Clerk. Ms. Lamone, we're going to hand you a copy of your appeal rights. I want to put that on the record for you. You have an absolute right to appeal. You perfect your appeal by filing a notice of appeal within, with the clerk of the Kern County Superior Court within 60 days of the date judgment was pronounced, which is today, 21 February 2018. You have a right to counsel to rep represent you on appeal. If you cannot afford counsel, you should petition the Court of Appeal, the 5th District Appellate, the 5th Appellate District to appoint an attorney to represent you. A transcript of all matters in this court on appeal will be provided to your appellate counsel as required by the California Rules of Court. Necessary names and addresses are Terry McNally, Clerk of the Superior Court Attention Appeals Unit. 1415 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California, 93301, and the Court of Appeal, 5th Appellate District, 2424 Ventura Street, Fresno, California, 93721. Ms. Marshall, anything further at this time, Counselor? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Smith? No, Your Honor. Senator Manning to the Department of Corrections, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.